good morning. My name's Matthew. Like Kat said, I'm the campus pastor at Revo's North Campus in Rural Hall, but I'm glad to be back at South Fork. I spent a lot of time here a long time ago, and it's good to be back with all of you. I want to ask you if you guys have a favorite movie or maybe a favorite food or parents, maybe a favorite child. I'm just joking. Don't answer that unless they're sitting next to you. So I, I picked the passage this morning that I think is the greatest of all time. That's what we were asked to do. Uh, and really that was kind of hard for me. So what I did when I, when I decided on this one verse is I picked the one that has impacted me the most. I picked the one that has challenged me the most, that has changed me the, the most, that continues even to challenge me the most. This is the verse that I pray most often. It's, it may be not so much just the greatest passage in my opinion, but it really holds the greatest truth And so it's the truth that's in this verse that's the foundation for my whole life. And so that's why I picked this one. And I want to share that verse and that truth with you guys today. And here's what we're going to see to kind of give you a roadmap of where we're going in in this one verse is we are going to see, God willing, that God is supreme. We're going to see what, what maybe theologians might call the supremacy of God and how that should be the foundation and the fuel for our lives. The foundation is, is the thing that's at the bottom on top of which everything else is built, right? You guys may know that about a foundation, at least I hope. And fuel is the thing that that drives you, that that drives the building that is done on top of that foundation. And so with God's help, we're gonna see this morning the fact that God is supreme and the truth that God's supremacy should be the foundation and the fuel for everything we do in our lives. But that leaves an important question. What does the supremacy of God mean? What does it mean for God to be supreme? Those are big words. Last week, Michael was with you guys. I thought he did a great job, had a great message for you, but he had some hot takes on the greatest of all time pizza flavor. Maybe you guys disagree with him. He said it was cheese because cheese is the base layer. It's the foundation, if you will, of all other pizza flavors. And so that's what what Michael said the greatest of all time pizza flavor was. Honestly, I like cheese. I can get on board with that, sure. But some of y'all may have been wanting to say other things like pepperoni or mushroom or bacon, right? Bacon. Or, or maybe you wanted Supreme, right? What's a Supreme pizza? Well, I Googled that because I had no idea. I was like, what, what goes on a Supreme pizza? Like what, what toppings go on a Supreme pizza? Supreme pizza is all of the best toppings. And so the point of a Supreme pizza is that it is the best pizza because it has all of the best stuff on one pie. It's supposed to be the goat, the greatest of all time pizza flavor. And so Silly, yes, but a helpful way to think about what supreme means. It's supposed to be something that is the best, that is the greatest. A dictionary definition I found that I actually thought worked as we talked about God. Supreme means superior to all others. It means better. It means greater. The the thing that is supposed to be the best and the greatest, that's what supreme means. And so, of course, the pizza analogy, it breaks down, right? Because people will disagree on what toppings are the best, what should be on a supreme pizza. But with God, the point is that he is supreme, the greatest, superior to all others, above all others, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, it's just who God is. That is the truth. He is supreme and it's a great truth. And it should be the foundation and the fuel for everything in our lives. And we're going to see that all from one verse that I call the greatest of all time. But before we get to that, let's pray. Father, we come to you uh, because we need your help to look at this verse, to see this truth, and not just hear it and understand it, but for it to truly be something that is grasped and understood, for it to truly be something that enters through our ears into our minds, but ultimately, God, we want it to take root in our heart. And I can't do that. And so I ask for your help this morning that that would be something that you would do by the power of your spirit for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So here it is, the greatest of all time, in my opinion, at least the one that's changed me the most, Psalm chapter 27, verse four. If you've got your Bible, Psalm 27 is where we're going to be. If you don't know where that is, the Bible has this middle section that you can just kind of open to randomly, and you'll probably be in or near the book of Psalms. It's a massive book. And so get to Psalm chapter 27. We'll look at verse four. Here's what it says. One thing have I asked of the Lord. Notice that asked of the Lord. We'll come back to that later. 
that will I seek after. And here's what the ask is, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So David, King David, the David of David and Goliath, he's writing this Psalm and he says, there's one thing that I'm asking of God, one thing. And it's right there in verse four, to dwell in the house of the Lord. So what this means is David's saying, I want to be with God. Because in the Old Testament, the temple or the house of the Lord, it had the idea of that's where God is. That's where God lives. It was, to maybe put it in modern language, if you wanted to be with God, you had to come to the church building. God was not in just everywhere, not just in Christians like we believe and know today, but you had to come to the temple. And so David's saying, I want basically to be with God at all time. He, he wants God's presence to be present in all things at all times of his life. But he didn't want to just, as this says, live or dwell just to like go there and sleep. You know, like maybe you think Nathan lives here at the South Fork campus, which he doesn't, by the way. But maybe you think like that's what he's wanting. You know, rent's expensive. And so he's wanting to live in the, the temple where rent might be free or at least a little bit cheaper. And he just wanted to shack up with God or something like that. That's not what, what he's saying. There's a purpose to what David says in Psalm chapter 27, verse four, the reason why he wants to dwell in the house of the Lord. And it'd be a lot like maybe a parent in the room would say, the one thing I want from God is that my kids would be safe and successful. Like that's, that's the one thing, or maybe that's two because there's an and in there. I don't know, but maybe he'll give me, you know, maybe we can do both of those, right? But the foundation for that request is that you love your kids. Because if you didn't love your kids, then you wouldn't want them to be safe or successful. So there's something that we see underneath what David says is his one thing. And that's what we see at the next part of verse four, when he says, this is what I'm asking of the Lord that I'm going to seek after, that I can dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And then we get this statement. This is the reason why. This is the foundation to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. David wants to spend time with God for a reason. And the reason is God. He says, I want to spend time with God for God. He wanted to be with God for the purpose of seeing God, not not any other reason. And and we get that from this phrase, beauty of the Lord, which you you may not know what that means. It's not the way we might think of beauty, like maybe a physical attraction or or physical beauty, something like that. But what this means is an innate beauty, something that's inside, something that's that's character-based maybe. So you could say that what he's saying is that his character, God's character, is perfect. It's beautiful. It's desirable. And David says, God, because of who you are, the one request that I have is that I would get to be with you. That's David's request. What drove him, what fueled him was God. Not what God could give, not what God could do, but God himself, who God is. So this shows us what David thought about God because his one request was to be with God. It shows us that God was so great, so satisfying to David that when he asked for one thing, he asked God for God. He shows this over and over, David does in the book of Psalms, but he also shows this in his life and just the way that he lived and the way that he talked. Look at what he says in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11. Yours, O Lord, listen to the language he uses about God. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. What we see is this. God's greatness was the foundation and the fuel, or maybe you could say the supremacy of God, much like we stated just a few minutes ago, was the foundation and the fuel for David's number one most important thing that he asked from God. He didn't ask for anything except God himself. But I I pointed this out and I said, "Don't, don't go past this. Remember this. Verse four said, one thing have I asked of the Lord. This being with God, this knowing God that David's talking about, he's so excited about, is only possible through God. That's why it says, asked of the Lord. David knows where to go for this request. He knows that only by God's grace, only by God's grace can he get this request of being able to see and know 
God. And Christians in the room, we know this is true. We've seen the ultimate fulfillment of this truth that in order to be with God, God has to give it, right? We've seen that. The only way we can be with this great God, know this supreme God, is through God in human flesh, namely Jesus Christ. Because this is the fundamental human problem, is it not? We need God, but we can't get to him. Our sins, our screw-ups, our mistakes, our, our failures, our evil hearts that fuel evil deeds have separated us from the perfections. The NLT translates the end of verse four in a way that I really like it. It calls it delighting in the perfections of God. It separated us from that perfection because we aren't perfect. And David knows that, which is why in verse four, he says, I'm asking this of the Lord. And so it is today, right? Right? We cannot be in right relationship with a perfect God as imperfect people without seeking the solution from God. That's why God sent Jesus, because we couldn't do it on our own. Salvation comes through Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice, that was the intervention from God that we had to have in order to know him. And now we know this, that through faith, through trust in Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, that is the only way anyone can be made right with God. And as Ephesians 2 says, it's only by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. It's a, it's a gift. It must be asked of the Lord. It must be received from the Lord. And so understanding this truth of God's greatness and making it the foundation and the fuel for our lives, it's only possible by asking it of the Lord. By no other name under heaven can we be saved, but by that of Jesus. And so the supremacy of God, what we're, we're talking about today, that can only be known and loved. It can only be the foundation and the fuel for our lives if it comes from God through Jesus Christ. But the second important question to ask about this is, all right, let's grant that it's true. Maybe you don't believe it, that's fine. Let's just pretend for a second, if you don't believe it, that it's true. Why should we build our lives on this? Why should we do that? Why should this be the foundation and the fuel for our lives? Why should seeing this indescribable greatness of God, his sovereign supremacy over all things, why should that be the foundation and the fuel for our lives? I've got seven points. You ever heard of a seven point sermon? Y'all thought I was going to preach the goat. I'm actually preaching the loat, the longest of all time. Seven points, seven reasons why we should see this supreme God, this great God, and make him the foundation and the fuel for our lives. First, and hopefully most obviously that this would be first, is it's true. It's true. We want to be people who build lives on truth, not lies. And so the Bible, one of the, with the great truths of the Bible, if you were to pull one thing, it's like, oh, I studied the whole Bible, and one thing I found, a lot of us would say, God's great. I mean, over and over, that's what we see. God is great. So what I want you to do, turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah is just a couple books to the right of Psalms, so it shouldn't take you long to get there. Now, we're not going to read it. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time. It's long, even though it is one of my favorite passages but we're going to see what Isaiah 40 teaches us about God's greatness. So as you look over it and, and I talk about what it says in there, I'll modernize the language a bit, but I want you to be able to see it with your own eyes. This is not something I'm making up right out of Isaiah 40. First, God's great. That's what it says. God is great. He measures all the waters of the oceans from all of the oceans on all of the earth. He can measure them in the palm of his hand. That right there is enough to hold all the waters of all the oceans. It says that he marks off the cosmos with the span of his hand. The span of your hand is this distance, the longest distance you can create with your hand. God looks at the cosmos and he goes, yeah, it's about that big to me. He can weigh the mountains of the earth on a scale. Think Appalachian, not Appalachian. Appalachian, think Rockies, think Andes, think Himalayas, think Pilot Mountain, like whatever mountain. All of those, God can just weigh them the same way we would weigh a couple onions on a scale at a grocery store. He, Isaiah 40 says, scoops up all the sands from all the coastlands on all the earth like we would just bend down to sweep some crumbs or some dust into a dustpan. 
God stretches out the skies, the heavens, the cosmos above us the same way we would pitch a tent on a camping trip with our kids. He created every single star that exists and he knows their names. That is the greatness of God in Isaiah chapter 40. Maybe you saw some of the images that were released from NASA's telescope that went out. It's called the Webb Telescope and you can see the farthest and the best and great images. And I've got one of them to, to share with us because it's just magnificent. I mean, just incredible to think that all of those little dots that you can't even count in this one photo is a star and God knows every single one of them. He named them, he created them. And we think we're pretty great that we have invented a telescope that can go out into space and get this magnificent images of the beauty of our world. And yet all we're doing is seeing what God has seen since the moment he created them and named them. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 17 describes God as the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God. Psalm chapter 50, verse 21, God says this, these things you have done and I have been silent. And he's talking here to wicked, evil, vile people who have done evil, wicked, vile things. And then he tells them why he's rebuking them, why he's saying you're wicked and have done bad things. This is what God said. You thought that I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. In verse 14 of this same chapter, God's starting this rebuke to the wicked person and and he enumerates some of these things. And finally he gets to the climax where he says, the thing you have done that is so wicked is you've tried to tame me, God says. You have tried to put God on a lower level. You, You have thought that I was one like you. You wanted to think that I was like humankind in some way. The inherent assertion here is that God is not like us. He is not like man. And to put God anywhere anywhere near man's level, is to sin. And while it's here in Psalm 27, 4, and the verses we've looked at, it is just the truth, the capital T truth of the Bible. God is great and glorious. And so we should make the supremacy of God, this truth, the foundation and the fuel for our lives, because it's true. Second, we should do it because it fills the lives of the most faithful people in the Bible. It fills the lives of of the most faithful people in the Bible. We're gonna look at at one guy and one gal, even though it's all over the place uh, in the scriptures, we don't have time to cover everybody because it's pretty much everybody that you could think of that's good and faithful. So the first, well, let's do ladies first. I did ladies first in the 930 volunteer service. So we'll do do ladies first right now too. Anybody ever heard of Mary, the mother of Jesus? Like, most people, even if this is your first time in a church, you're like, yeah, I think I'd know, I've heard about that because Jesus was, was born of, of a human and I think that lady's name was Mary. Mary was chosen by God to give birth to the son of God, Jesus. And Mary said this, Luke chapter one, verse 46 and verse 47. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. Mary is the one who was chosen to carry Jesus, to bring the savior of the world into the world. Yet who does Mary praise? My soul magnifies the Lord is what Mary says. My spirit, it rejoices, not in me because I'm carrying him, but in God, my savior. It fills the lives of the most faithful people in the Bible. Moses, that's the guy I chose. There's plenty of other ladies and and guys to choose from, but I chose Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. We see what Moses really wants. We see what maybe he might say his one thing is. And oddly, for another hero of the faith like David, it's very similar to David's. Because Moses, he's seen God do some of the most incredible things. Think about it. Burning bush. He's seen God do the, the 10 plagues in Egypt. He's seen God part the Red Sea. He's seen God send manna from heaven. And and ultimately, one of the greatest things God did was he forgave the Israelites for all of the dumb things they did. He's seen God's mercy. And it's after all of that that he says, all right, God, this is what I want. Chapter 33, verse 18 of Exodus, Moses replied, show me your glory. What Moses wanted was to see God. 
Not what God had done, not more miracles. God, let's see something else. What else can you do? He just wanted to see God. We should make the supremacy of God the foundation and the fuel for our lives because it's true and because it fills the lives of the most faithful people in the Bible. Third, it creates trust. Creates trust. And what I mean by creating trust is that it dispels, it checks worry and anxiety. I know those are buzzwords, right? This is, you could even call it a, a pandemic probably, that worry and anxiety is, is a absolute rampage in our culture, is it not? It is on a rampage in our culture. And yet what we see throughout the Bible is that a view of God as supreme creates trust. It checks anxiety and worry. Watch this from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. Talking about Moses again. And you may know this story, you may not, but I'll give you the rundown. Moses murders a guy uh, in Egypt, an Egyptian actually, and the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, is after Moses because of obvious reasons. He's killed an Egyptian. And this is what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27 said about Moses. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. Not fearing the king's anger. He wasn't afraid. He was not worried. He was not anxious. Why? He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. What, what, cast out that fear of the most powerful man in the world at this time, probably. It was the fact that he saw God. And when he saw God, he said, there's no need to worry. I know who God is. I don't need to fear this king. What about one of these, one of our favorite verses, Psalm chapter 46, verse 10. Anybody know this one? Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. We love to, to have our coffee mugs out and our Bibles open and post a picture on Instagram and say like, be still and know. I love to be still and know. It's about peaceful trust, right? That, that's what this is all about. It's about this peaceful trust that God is God. But what I want us to see about this trust is what precedes it and then what comes right after it. We'll start in verse eight of Psalm 46. It'll even be on the screen so you can see it. Come behold the works of the Lord how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Now be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Do you see what it says? Because of how great God is, now you can be still and know. Peaceful trust is found in the shadow of a big God. Our worry, our anxiety is dispelled in the light of how great he is. And so we should make the supremacy of God a foundation and the fuel for our lives because it creates trust. Fourth, it fuels joy. It fuels joy. I know often we think that joy and happiness in, in relation to God is when we see God as loving as kind and forgiving, which he is all of these things. But we also think that, that it, it doesn't come when we see his greatness or his glory or his holiness or his unapproachable light or his exclusivity, the fact of who he is. We're like, oh, that's, some of that's kind of scary. We like the loving, forgiving, kind side of God. But that's not the picture the Bible paints. It actually says that gladness and joy Happiness is found in seeing God's greatness. Check this out, Psalm 97, verse one. The Lord reigns. The Lord is above everything. That's what that means. The Lord is on top, on the throne, in charge. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. You go to verse eight and nine of the same chapter, Psalm 97. Zion hears and rejoices and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, Lord, for you. So, so why are they glad? Why are they happy? Why are they rejoicing right here? For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are far exalted above all other gods. Joy is found in the greatness and supremacy of God. And you could even do a little sidebar. I almost made this the eighth point, but you know, seven is the perfect completed number, so we're just gonna throw it on here. Seeing God as supreme gives you joy in your suffering too. In your suffering too. It's like, is that possible? Can I be joyful in the midst of suffering? Absolutely. 
Acts chapter 5 talks about Peter, a couple other disciples were preaching Jesus. And the Jewish leaders at that time, they didn't like that, and so they told them to stop. And they said, look, I know you told us to stop, but this is what God's told us to do, and so we're going to do it. And so they did it. And then they brought him in, it's called the council in, in Acts chapter 5, and they beat him. Peter and the other disciples were beaten for preaching Jesus. And then you get this curious verse that I read last week, and I thought, man, I've already written this whole thing out, but I'm going to throw it in there because it's too good to leave out. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council. These are those people who had just beaten them. They had just been whipped, beaten. And they left the presence of the council rejoicing. Not worry, not sad, not crying. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. When the name of Jesus, when God is that great, and you're like, man, he's going to count me worthy enough to suffer? It hurts. It's not fun. I wish it wouldn't happen, sure. But they rejoiced. You can see it in Psalm 27, too. That's what we read verse 4 out of. David is going through hard times. You, uh, we don't have time to read it all, but you go back on your way home. Well, maybe not on your way home. Maybe when you get home, read it, see what's around it, and say, man, what, what's David up to here in Psalm 27? And you'll see the suffering he's in. And yet, what does he ask for? Not God make my life easy, not God take my suffering away, but God, I want you. Just like we sang in that third song, which we didn't plan, by the way. We should make the supremacy of God the foundation and fuel for our lives because it fuels our joy. Fifth, and maybe my favorite, it makes the familiar fantastic. It makes the familiar fantastic. It takes those things that we hear every week in church that you heard about in Sunday school if you grew up in church, those things that you've kind of gotten used to that are boring, that are mundane, that you're like, do I really have to listen to some guy talk about this for 35 minutes again? Like those things, and it reanimates them. It makes them beautiful again. It makes them fantastic again. Christmas in July, anybody, anybody, anybody do that? I don't know anybody that does that, but I've heard that's a thing. Think about Christmas. I'm only about to preach my second Christmas series uh, of my entire life. And I'm already going, man, I said a lot about it last year. Is there anything left? I mean, you know, you can get to that point. I grew up in church. I've been in church 25 years. And I I know what Christmas is about. It can get boring or mundane. Or can it? Because how much greater is Christmas when the God that came to earth to dwell among sinners is the God who is great, supreme, high and lifted up, holy and set apart? If that's the God that comes to dwell among sinners, how much greater is Christmas? Rather than if he was just some cosmic benevolent being who was going to come and save us anyways because we're the center of his universe. How much greater is it when the Jesus who was born in a manger on Christmas is the same God who Acts 17, 25 says, is not served by human hands? How much greater is Christmas when Jesus who came to earth, God in human flesh, is the same one that Colossians 1 describes as the image of the invisible God, as the one who created all things, including the manger that he's about to be born into, who is preeminent, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's the Merry Christmas. Not the one that says he was going to come anyways because you're so great. But no, because God is so great. Can you believe that he would come? Why would he come? It's incredible. What about mercy? Mercy gets mundane sometimes, doesn't it? Mercy means that you're not getting what you deserve. And if you've been around church, you've heard, right? Jesus died. And so because he died and he was resurrected, now if you believe and you trust in him, you don't have to go to hell. That's like, all right, that's mercy. I I deserve wrath, but instead I get grace. Oh, that's so good. But you hear that over and over and over, and you ever think, man, this is kind of getting a little mundane? I hope not. But if it does, think about it like this. A greater view of God, maybe a, a supreme view, if you will, sweetens our experience of his mercy. Because if he's not that great, and our sin is not that offensive, then his mercy is not all that great. Maybe this would would help you understand what I'm trying to get at here. Which is a greater act of mercy that you would rejoice in? You don't have to answer it out loud, just think about it. Which one of these two options I'm going to give you is a greater act of mercy that you would rejoice in? You ready? First one, you offend me, and I should fight you, and I should try to kill you because you've sinned against me, you've offended me, but instead I show mercy. 
Or is it a greater act of mercy if you offended and sinned against Mike Tyson in such a way that he should try and fight you and kill you, but instead he shows you mercy? Which one's greater? And which one makes you rejoice more? Which one makes you happier? I mean, I could probably take a couple of y'all in this room, but like Mike Tyson, I bet, I bet he could get you guys. Even you guys online, I don't know, I don't know how big y'all are, but I bet Mike Tyson would have the upper hand there. Which, one's, which one causes you to rejoice more? The one when the guy that's most powerful and strong is the one that shows mercy, even though he shouldn't. God's mercy to us is magnified when we magnify God. Isaiah 57, verse 15. I almost chose this as our GOAT passage. Decided not to um, settle with this one, but I had to read it anyways. I love it. This is what it says. It talks about that mercy. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity and whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. We should make the supremacy of God the foundation and the fuel for our lives because it makes these familiar things fantastic. Sixth, it fuels our fear of God and our obedience to him. It fuels our fear of God and our obedience to him. Multiple times in the gospels when Jesus was asked questions, one of the ones that he was asked a couple different times was this, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? Which one's the greatest? And Jesus, every time, answered, the first one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he even goes on and continues and says, and if you get those two right, all the others will fall into place. What's he saying? Making God number one. Loving him not with part of who you are, not with your Sunday morning at 11 a.m., but with all you are. Loving God with all you are, that and greater love for people will fuel obedience to the other commands. When God is number one, fear of God and obedience to him falls into place. When God is supreme, all the rest falls into place. So we should make the supremacy of God the foundation and the fuel for our lives because it fuels the fear of God and obedience to him. Seventh and finally, It's a great evangelistic tool. The supremacy of God is a great evangelistic tool. You guys have a a friend or or maybe a family member or or maybe a coworker, somebody you care about that doesn't know Jesus? And you you think, "I, I want them to come to know Jesus in a saving way so that they have faith in him so that they know the joy that I experience, so they know about this God and they get to spend eternity with him. But how do I do that? This is is a great way. The seventh thing is that it's a great evangelistic tool, and we get it from all over the Bible, but especially Deuteronomy chapter 5. If you want to read it later, it's just verses 22 to 33 of Deuteronomy chapter 5. And the people of Israel, it's described in one of those verses that they saw God's glory and greatness because God came down on a pillar of fire and he spoke with his voice, booming over the millions of Israelites, the Ten Commandments. And what is incredible about this is witnessing that caused the Israelites to seek a mediator for their situation. God's greatness and glory made the Israelites say to Moses, you have to go talk to God. You cannot let God do that again. God cannot speak directly to us. If we encounter his glory and his greatness, we will surely die, Moses. You need to go be our mediator because he's so great, so powerful, and we are so not that that it's gonna kill us. Moses, go up on the mountain and you be the one who communicates with God and then you come back down and tell us what he said. When God is powerful, holy, great, glorious, it creates a need for a savior, for somebody to go between you and God. Is this not the problem that the church in America faces right now when we're interacting with culture? The people around, they don't need God because the God they think that we talk about is plush, he's loving, he, he's never angry, he, do, he doesn't really do anything all that great, he's never seen as high and exalted, lifted up and unreachable. But when the Israelites saw how great God was, 
when they realized all these things are true about him, they said, we need somebody to go in between us. We can't do it. God, God's too great for us. We need a mediator. We need a savior. And so God fixed that problem with Moses temporarily, but he fixed it eternally with Jesus. So if you're looking for a way to share Jesus with your family members, your friends, your coworkers, someone you know, live a life that is enthralled by and enamored with God's great glory. We should make the supremacy of God the foundation and the fuel for our lives because it is a great evangelistic tool. Last question. How do we do that? All right, we've seen what, what David says in Psalm 27, 4. God's great. God's supreme. We, we see that that's what the Bible says, and, and we see why we should do that. All the great good things that God gives to people who, who have that view of him. But, but how do we do that? How do we take this and make it a part of our Monday morning? Let me give you three things. First, read the Bible, but read the Bible looking for God, not for you. Ask the question, what does this say about God? How does this make me love God more? How does this make God look great? Not how does this apply to my life? Because if God's great, we just saw seven ways that it will apply to your life. So look, how does this make God look great? How does it make me love God more? What does it say about God? Read the Bible looking for God, not for you. Second, as you read your Bible and you find one of those truths that makes God look great or, or makes you love God more, or you find out a truth about who God is, Get out a little, a little index card, rip it in half even if you want to, and write it down. Write down that truth, stick it in your pocket. Have it like a cough drop for you. You know, if, you, if you've got a cough, you always keep some in your pocket in case you need it. So you keep that truth in your pocket every single day. So that when you go, all right, I've got one for this, I've got one for today. I asked God before I read this, you know, give me a truth for today. And he did. So I wrote it down and I'm sticking it in my pocket. Now when I go to pull out my phone or get my keys or, or I just brush up against it and I feel the paper, I'm reminded of that truth. Or maybe you're, you're always on your phone for work or you're just always on your phone because that's just who we are these days. So type it into your phone, screenshot it, make it the background every single day, get a new one with a different color behind it so it doesn't become something you just look past or whatever you want to do. Make it pretty. I, I don't care. Just get it. And then every time you go to swipe, every time you go to open your phone, there it is. A truth that makes God great. And third and finally, we know we should read our Bible, but we should also pray. How do we do this in prayer? Litter your prayers with praise. Don't just start with praise, but get as good as you possibly can at praising God from start to finish good way to start would be read through Psalms. And just every time you see the psalmist who's writing whatever Psalm you're reading, praise God for something. You also, don't just read it, don't just put it through your head, but you, praise God for that. All these things though, they're just pathways that I pray God will use to create a view of him as the greatest, most glorious reality in your life. I don't want us to be like, like a child chasing bubbles, right? They're, they're, they run after him, they jump, they, and right when they think they've got it, it disappears and they have to go chase another one. But instead, I want us to continually, as David in Psalm 27, 4, seek the thing that is truly the greatest of all time. Chase joy that is eternal, not expiring. Spend your life chasing down something that lasts. Run after that fountain that's always flowing, that well that never runs dry. Chase after the God whose beauty and perfections know no end. Let's pray together. God, that's who you are. A God whose beauty and perfections know no end. Whether we believe it or not, whether we like it or not, it must be true of who you are. It's what you revealed to us in your word. So God, do that work in these moments to make it real in our hearts and in our lives. Send us from this place praising you. God, we've searched, we've looked, we've spent so much of our lives searching the world and we have found nothing that can satisfy the, deeping, the deepest longings of our souls like you, Lord. God, there's nothing, nothing that's better than you. So we ask you, to make that true for us. And we praise you for that. In the name of Jesus, amen.